Gabe, everyone, SPSM, we know that you are following on Twitter, and we have a great show for you tonight. We have a wonderful guest. I cannot wait for you to meet her, especially since uh, she was newer to me from the field of suicide prevention. But for those of us uh, who are in uh, the family medicine and the healthcare social media communities. You're going to be so excited. I know a lot of you are fangirling for Pam Weibel. She is with us tonight. But before we get into that, just a couple of items of business. First of all, we're super thrilled that you're here. We want you to go to the SPSM page, like us on Facebook. That's where you're going to get the updates about what we're doing every week. And so you can make choices about what things you're going to watch and when. Uh, additionally, we are just a week and some change away from the American Association of Suicidology National Conference. So follow along, hashtag SPSM. I'm at Dr. Foreman. I'm actually not going to be moderating for a lot of the show because we have uh, Dr. Mike Sevilla here who's going to be one of the guest mods. And Mr. Tony Wood and I are going to be following along and assisting via the Twitter chat because we know it's going to, well, we had a lot of a lot of hits, people saying they're going to be here, so we know that it's going to go fast tonight. We uh, have a special request. Dr. Weibel is trying to save the lives of physicians who are dying by suicide because it turns out they're a high-risk group, and I've learned some things just in the last week getting ready for this uh, particular evening. She is about ready to have some cool programming, super cool, we'll post it, about ready to hit the social medias. She really can help save lives the more that we give it hits and distribute it. So just like we've done for other organizations like Suck It Suicide and some of the other organizations who come on, we want you to make sure and give it a lot of love this week if you can. So for those of you who have Hootsuites who, uh, or other queuing, social media queuing programs, we want you to please be on the lookout for uh, at Pam Weibel and me and when and we'll put stuff on the SPSM page, please do distribute to your networks. This could save the lives of a doctor who could be caring for you. Uh, without any further ado, we're going to introduce our two other mods before we get to our guest. Let's start with my favorite co-host, sorry Mike, Dr. Bart Andrews. Hey, what's going on? I am so excited about Dr. Pamela Weibel being on the show tonight. It was actually through SPSM chat that I was introduced to Dr. Weibel. Um, I think it was the amazing Amelia Leto um, at Toes um, who, who mentioned you, um, Pamela. And that's when I first started getting interested um, in, in following you and, and seeing the good things. I read an article that you that had written. Um, and when I got to meet you in St. Louis a few months back, I was a little starstruck. It was so cool. And I just read your book, which was amazing. Um, and I am honored and just so excited about you being here tonight. So that, that's what I want to say is um, what a treat this is, and thank you for being on tonight. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. It's we will to get to the introduction just very quickly. I want to give Mike a chance to introduce himself, and then I want to give you some serious airtime, Dr. Weibel. Mike. Yes, 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 briefly, I'm uh, Dr. Mike Seville. I'm a family doc. We, that's what we share in common. You can uh, find me at drmikeseville.com. And, and my new uh, nickname on the Internet is Bodie McBoatface. You Google that. You I'm guys sorry? What's going on with that? Bodie McBoatface. Uh, How did this happen, Mike? Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it later. Uh, so, yeah, so it's great to be here. We should just jump in. I'm, I'm very excited that we're going to have this Tell chat. us how you heard about Dr. Weibel. We, I, like, we have to share our stories. How did you find out about her? Uh, well, I, I have been uh, uh, stalking her and admire of her uh, for a while. Been uh, you know checking out some of her books and w watched her TED talk. Um, I also watched a couple things on YouTube where she was talking to medical students about how to kind of prevent some of this type of stuff. And uh, um, you know, and and I, I really kind of um, um, well. I mean, I, it's it's really normal what she's talking about as far as that medical school is tough, our training is tough. I mean, of course, I went through some depression uh, symptoms myself, and and that's really kind of why her story kind of really resonated with me, and 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 I'm really really excited to to be a part of this chat tonight. And without any further ado, Dr. Weibel rhymes with Weibel, so I won't get your name wrong like every other guest. We are so glad you're here. Tell us a little bit about who you are. 
Okay, so I'm a family physician, and both my parents are physicians, and so I saw medicine in its heyday, and I know what it's like to love your job and love your patients, have your patients love you, and and uh, and it was just really weird because I, when I got to medical school, it was barbaric. It was I felt like I went back like 200 years into some sort of weird torture chamber and so um, I thought maybe I was the only one experiencing this but then after medical school I uh, found out that both the men I dated in medical school, uh, medical students uh, that I dated died by suicide. I was suicidal myself and when I started writing about physician suicide I ended up with a blog that would never die that was getting comments like two, three years later has hundreds of comments because this is a huge issue that's being covered up and I didn't quite realize how much of a cover up until I just started taking it head on. So that's me and I, I love what I do and I love, I feel like the best way to save people, I'm a healer by nature, and the best way to save people is to save our medical students and doctors and make them as healthy as possible so they can help us, you know? So let's kind of go uh, go backwards a little bit as far as medical school training. You know, when you talk to people, when you talk like to the general public, how would you describe your medical school experience and kind of the origins of some of these feelings that we go through, especially when it comes to depression and and unfortunately suicide for some of these medical students and even physicians. Well, it just seemed barbaric to me. Other people have described it as a dehumanizing nightmare, a boot camp, a cult, um, uh, my own personal Vietnam. I mean, these are the ways that I've heard it described by others, and I would have to concur. And I think the reason why it's so backward is because we're still in allopathic medicine and osteopathic medicine. We're still functioning under a 17th century um, medical education model based on Descartes, which is ridiculous. Reductionism and reductionism just sees people as machines, like a really interesting set of organs in a in a bag of skin, and so it's very dehumanizing and, uh, and it injures our spiritual. Um, it injures our soul, you know. And so, this is the model that these normal, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed people that just want to help people are being indoctrinated in, and um, it takes a lifetime to overcome the injuries that we that we that we sustain in medical school and some people never recover now I, I, I saw one of your stories or reading one of your stories that you actually quit medical school and kinda didn't quit medical school can you share a little bit about that well I found out during my first year that we were gonna have to do dog labs like actually murder somebody's prior pet like to make it through our physiology labs this was just ludicrous to me so I I, I signed the papers to drop out because I was just appalled that this, this was even in the curriculum. And um, I didn't have enough money to, to leave my apartment, and I actually had a bunch of pets <laughs> living in my apartment. And so I had nowhere to go. Uh, my tuition was already paid. Um, my anatomy partner convinced me to stay. He said, like, if you don't have money to leave, why don't you just stay and keep taking tests and see what happens? And four years later, I graduated, and several years later, he died of suicide. So um, the whole reason I am a doctor is because this anatomy partner of mine convinced me to stay in medical school, and he's, I can't even thank him because he's not alive because, yeah, it took his life. So... Um, and it's it's just I mean just kind of learning more about you and, and learning your story. I I have a lot of my own colleagues who, you know that you know it's one of the things is that you know we don't talk about this, we don't reach out, you know that we use you know especially in in in, in our circles we use phrases like oh you know you know reaching out for help is weakness and 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 we don't want to you know if 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 somebody is, is talking about their emotions it's it's a it's a really bad thing and. Um, I, one of the things that I, that I love that you're doing is that you, you just, you're just kind of really talking about this. Um, unfortunately, the suicide part too. But you know, just you know, just, just we 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 just don't express ourselves, and 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 we don't we're really kind of um, kind of brought up in in med or medical training just to not to just talk about this. We're, we're just to to take tests to just focus on whatever the next thing is and kind of ignore everything else including our own health and our own well-being. Yeah, I think I'm kind of um, 
going 180 degrees in the other direction there. Um, just the title of my TEDx talk, How to Get Naked with Your Doctor. Um, my picture that's out there that's uh, in a bathtub, actually. You know, like, I am all about being vulnerable, being honest, being transparent, and telling the truth. So I think that, you know, silence won't save us. We absolutely need to tell the truth to the public. The public deserves to hear the truth. I mean, they're very confused about why their health care isn't quite what they want it to be and why they're not really receiving that therapeutic relationship with their doctor. I think they have no idea that their physician is, is injured emotionally um, far worse than the patient's. We're dying at you know two to time two to three times the rate of our patients by suicide, and so people deserve to know this, and we simply must talk about it to solve it. Because where would we be with Ebola or HIV if we were afraid to talk about it and we just swept the bodies away into unmarked graves? Yeah. Uh, uh, so one of the things in listening to you talk and reading your book, one of the things I don't think any of us who aren't physicians realize what medical school training is like. Um, and I think one of the big eye-openers for me in getting to know you, getting to know your work, was how traumatic the training process is. One of the things that you mentioned in the book, and several students comment on this, that there was actually an anatomy professor that would instruct students, look, if you're going to kill yourself, here's how you do it, because I don't want you to survive this and be, then be a burden to your society. And this wasn't just a one-off. This wasn't just something that just happened once or twice. That This is something that happens in medical schools every day. So could you, I think for those of us who haven't been to medical school, could you comment on what that experience is like um, so that we can get at least a taste of that understanding of what that's like? Well, so medical school is a very competitive environment. Part of the problem is there's not enough residency slots for all the medical students. Um, so you, you create a dynamic in which some people know they're never going to be able to practice as physicians even after they graduate with $300,000 of student debt. There are not simply enough residency spots for them and you cannot practice as a physician in this country without doing at least an internship, which is the first year of a residency. So you kind of pit these people against each other for like basic survival. And on top of all that, they're not sleeping because they have to study so much. And you know, they can be up 110 hours a week sometimes in, in their residency programs. And um, working at that pace is just impossible to think clearly. Then there's bullying and hazing and all these things, which I think are the result of just unmet mental health needs for generation upon generation of physicians. I mean, we've known that physicians have a high suicide rate since 1858 in England it was first discussed. So, uh, but we have not done anything about this constructively that's, that's, um, dealt, that's dealt with this head on in the last, you know, 160 plus years. Like, why have we not dealt with this? And so what's going on in medical schools, it really is kind of like a military boot camp with no sleep and bullying and anyone who cries or is a sensitive person or different in any way like I was made fun of as like a flower child or whatever you're literally like picked out of the group and you're the you're you're going to be receiving the bullying that freaks everyone else out that makes them want to conform because they certainly don't want to stand out like you and be the next person to be bullied you know and publicly flogged by this group of kind of mean people <laughs> So, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a scary experience. And just so people understand, you know, I went back to my 22nd medical school reunion with my mother who was attending her 50th medical school reunion. We went to the mm -hmm. same medical school. And just even driving back to the school, which I had never visited since I graduated, I felt like I was going to throw up and we almost had to stop in the car and my mother also felt sick because even after 22 or 50 years, like driving back to the place where you – were injured, it still brings such a visceral experience of illness to the surface. It's very sad. I mean, we carry this with us for the rest of our lives. It's depressing, you know. So, so um, uh, just what impact does that have on the care of the physicians? So then a physician that's been trained in this model, when they then have uh, are working with someone who is trying to be emotionally vulnerable, who's trying to seek help for their depression or displaying those sorts of things, how, how, how does that impact the type of care that, that physicians provide? Well, I think physicians have compassion fatigue because they haven't been able to take care of themselves and they're a little bit freaked out even though they're pretending in their starched white coats that everything is fine. So they have no reserves, meaning they're functioning basically on fumes. It's very hard to give to somebody else the care that you've never received. And if you've been traumatized, 
like what what do you have to give? I mean, it's it's um, it's an impossible situation. So anyone that's doing this well, as a physician, I have to commend them for having overcome like incredible obstacles. And uh, you know, I've been in therapy for like ten years just to recuperate from the assault to my system that medical school was. And so, uh, but not everyone chooses to seek therapy or try to heal from this. So it's um. It's just a sad situation for the for the people that just want to help people, and for the people that are seeking our help. The most vulnerable, you know, are often not getting anything, and often being, by the way, made fun of. I don't know if you've seen or read that book, The House of God. Um, you know, I mean, or I don't have a TV, but I know on TV you can kind of probably see callous doctors and the way they interact and possibly make fun of patients when they're not around, and it's a uh, it's a sad scene, you know. It, it is. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Like uh, I, no, I mean it's it, it, it's so much resonated with me going back to that medical school campus. I I, I live forty five minutes away. Sometimes I go and, and give talks there, and it's kind of like going back to the scene of the crime, you know. And it's just like, ah, and, and and you know, I'm having these kind of these kind of flashbacks too. And I and I think I from from what uh, something I was reading or something that that I was watching that you were talking about is that. Um, you you know people or people who've written to you who are physicians and and who you know they go to different states or they go and change their name to get their mental health care to see that they're therapists. I mean, is that is that stuff kind of really just happening? Yeah, that that is happening. A friend of mine is a psychiatrist. Actually, drives 200 miles out of town and uses a fake name and pays cash to get mental health care because you know not only are we injured in this uh, medical training system that basically takes normal people and dehumanizes us and teaches us to have um, I mean just not to I mean we, we disconnect with our soul it's 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 a uh, very dehumanizing and and um, and we lose the sense of who we were what we wrote on our personal statement when we started all those beautiful dreams we had of healing people we just um, are putting one foot in front of the other and in survival mode I don't know if you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs it's basically medical school throws you to the bottom rung of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and you might as well your body probably has the experience of living in a like a Syrian refugee refugee camp. I mean your mind knows I'm in a I'm in a first world country and I'm in medical school but your body experiences this like extreme trauma. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I think I've lost track of your question but yeah it's um, it th these these experiences they don't go away they stay in your body forever these feelings of um, trauma unless you get treatment for it and I think <laughs> Um, okay, the other thing I was going to mention is not only are we traumatized, if that's not enough, okay, <laughs> we are prevented from seeking mental health care because we have to mark that on our licensing applications and potentially go in front of the board and lose our license or have a black mark, you know, and have professional suicide, essentially. Um, so it's just really, really stigmatizing, and it's... It, we're, we're living in the 17th century under a philosophy that makes no sense, you know, in modern times. And we need to, to stop this. We need to stop yeah. injuring people, our best and brightest healers, on their way into medical school. Yeah, I, I think th this is so powerful. I mean, I, 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 clinical psychology training was nothing like medical training in many ways. But, but as far as experiencing, like I experienced um, substance use and depression while I was in my internship, and the treatment that I got, once that came out, I was really treated like I had committed an ethical violation. So I wasn't treated like someone who was sick that needed care. I was actually treated like somebody who had uh, uh, made this major transgression. Um, they had to vote on me on whether I was allowed to continue in the program, right? So if I had had cancer or had, a, had, a, had some sort of hypertensive crisis, there would have been no vote. They would have just notified my program and we would have moved on. But because my problem was alcoholism and depression, they had to have a vote. Um, and I was put under these really bizarre conditions that if I had had what, a, a legitimate problem that wasn't my fault, of course, um, I wouldn't have been put under those conditions. And, and it took me 17 years to even talk about my suicide attempt because I was sure that if that came out that, that I would never get to be a psychologist, um, never get my PhD. Um, and, and Pamela, while you were talking and reading your book, I mean, so, there was just so much going on for me. One, we don't see our doctors as human beings. 
right? Um, and I think that's one of the things that really hit me is we see doctors as being these all-powerful in control and kind of the, the gatekeepers of our health, right? And in that process, we lose a connection with them as people. And, and, and the book really struck home to me that when I'm meeting with a doctor, I need to view them as a person too because I have no idea what they've been through to get where they are. So that was that brought me to tears because there's been times I've been angry at doctors and realized, oh my God, I wasn't at all considering what they're going through. The second thing that I noticed in your book was that we don't train our physicians to be free thinkers, to be rebellious. And in fact, they're beaten down to be these conformist, this conformist mindset, which makes change and innovation, I would imagine, where we would want change and innovation to be something a big deal. It doesn't sound like it's on it at all. So given what you've been through, you kind of broke the mold. Tell us what, so to break out of that mindset that, and I, I, it's almost kind of a form of brainwashing. In reading the book, it looks like a form of brainwashing to me, right? What helped you break out of that mold, and, and what was that like for you to do that? Well, uh, people in my profession have thanked me for being courageous, but I have to say that, that I don't consider this courageous. This is just my normal personality. I'm a firstborn, stubborn, loudmouth child that's used to getting my way. So it's like I'm not going to change my basic personality for medical school or my profession. So this just comes natural to speak the truth and to be unafraid. And just uh, so I'm doing, you know, my usual thing, right? Um, uh, so the thing is that what helped me, I think, that, that other people don't necessarily have the benefit of this, is that both my parents are physicians, and I knew what medicine could be like, and I knew that the indoctrination I was receiving was unnecessary and cruel. Mm -hmm. So um, I could see right through it, you know. So I just told the truth <laughs> all the way through. Um, and. What was interesting is that I would have some of my superiors look down on me or belittle me, but then I would have others people come to me and like secretly be cheering for me. So I knew that I was representing the group overall by speaking out, but other people didn't feel so comfortable, whether it's not just their, maybe their personality isn't as bold as mine or, you know, just for whatever reason they were scared to speak, so I was basically holding the megaphone up for myself and for my colleagues from early on, from like age 21 when I took my medical school on on these dog labs with the petition and and just went for it, <laughs> you know. So, does that answer so you your did, question? Yeah. It, so right from the get go, you weren't going to let medical school, medical school change who you were, um, right? And I would I would imagine that created some challenges at, at, during medical school that that all wasn't an easy road. Yes, I'm unindoctrinatable, if that's a word. Um, but uh, um, it, I mean, I stood out. Obviously, people, you know, made fun of me. I was the brunt of various jokes, especially during my psychiatry rotation. I this is really interesting. I felt like I could relate to the patients better than the physicians. And then the patients were whispering in my ear, you know, we're the normal ones. They're crazy. And I was like. I think you might be be honestly speaking the truth about that because you know having professional distance is not normal and um, some of the ways that these doctors were treating these psychi psychiatric patients were really abusive. Um, by the way, like my mom's a psychiatrist, and <laughs> there's a really good story she tells me of um, also having a serious problem with her training in psychiatry. Of course, you know many years ago. Um, she did not really believe in ECT back then, um, and she, you know, was supposed to, you know, to graduate, you had to do so many procedures and so many, you know, uh, of these things that, that gives give drugs out to people that she didn't think needed them and all sorts of things like that. But anyway, she was doing an ECT procedure and she didn't plug in the machine, but she went through all the motions so the person felt like they were getting this therapy, and um, and then afterwards they were like, oh, I feel so much better, and. And so, you know, my mom just, I guess, did that type of psychiatry. Um, I don't know what you call that, placebo? I don't know. Anyway, so, um, yeah, I I'm on a tangent here. I'm sorry. I just think that our um, psychiatric medical training is very antiquated, and our medical training in general is antiquated, and we need to get up into the year 2016, okay, so that we can serve people as real human beings, you know, as aware, present spiritually evolved people. Yeah. 
So the, the the Twitter feed is just just going absolutely um, off the chain here. So there's there's several things I want to get to. One, we, we talked about this earlier. You mentioned it in your book. Um, when folks go into medical school, these are normal, well-adjusted, high-achieving folks. But when they leave, if they leave, if they survive, um, their risk of suicide is two to three times higher. Right. The, the level of depression and anxiety, uh, St. Louis University did a study on their uh, medical students and found this anxiety rate was 60%. The depression rate was like 27%. Now, they've changed that. They've changed that. What is it that leads to that? What is it that, that leads to this, this, this huge change in their functioning? Well, they've been methodically dehumanized as a group. They've been assaulted collectively as a group, like um, probably how a, a group would be assaulted at Auschwitz or any other situation where you take a group of people and you assault them and they don't see a way out and they just spiral down to the lower rung of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and get into like basically just physiologic survival mode, which leaves no time for friendships, little time for sleep. Some people are holding their bladder and their bowels for like nearly 24 hours. They're not drinking, um, you know, any fluid. Um, there, a friend of mine has had to work 168-hour shifts with little sleep at a, as a physician, you know, in an, in an Eastern Oregon hospital, actually. And so this is inhumane. And actually, the way we're treated. I don't just throw the word abuse out there lightly, but if you read the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, there are multiple articles in there that are not being upheld in medical schools, clinics, and hospitals in the way they treat their own employees and their students. So if you, if as a patient listening to this who has mental health care needs, believe me, you're not going to have your needs met when the people that you're going to for help are having their human rights assaulted on a daily basis. And it's just unconscionable and very upsetting to me that I've I've lost so many people. And it's you know, and every day that we don't talk about this, there's more that are dying. I, it's just we we could stop this tomorrow if there was a public insight. I mean, the public outrage would be huge if people knew this was going on, right? And um, so. And I don't, yes. Any other questions? <laughs> I can obviously. Yeah. Talk so I I think you you as you. Your passion about this and your your willingness to share the story is so inspiring to me. P please tell us about the pictures behind you, the folks that are behind you that we're looking at right now. Okay, so these are people that I've. Um, I actually don't have the the pictures up of the people that I dated in medical school. They're up there, but they're kind of hidden because their families don't want to release that it's a suicide. They just told me it's an accidental overdose, and because of religious reasons and other cultural reasons, like I'm not at free will to even give the names of the men I dated in medical school because, for fear of like I don't know, like harming their family or something. But anyway, they're up there. Uh, uh, here, here, here's one. He's his face is covered because his family's religious. So whatever. Okay, the other people are people whose families have reached out to me and have been willing for me to publish their suicide notes in my book called Physician Suicide Letters, which you read. Um, you know, very sad. Here is you have a mother and daughter both died by suicide. The 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 daughter was a third year medical student who overdosed, and then her mother just couldn't handle the grief. And a year later, she succumbed in the same method as her daughter. And it's just you know that's another thing. Once you lose one family member to suicide, you know the rate for everyone else goes up. I mean, what is the risk for the remaining husband? And she has one sister left. I mean, it's horrible. These people would be alive if they worked at Walmart, but because they went to medical school, they're dead. You know, it's just so unbelievable. And, like, how str it's one thing. I mean, you don't want this to happen to any profession, banking, realtors. I mean, of course, it would be horrible for any profession, but you go into healthcare to help people. You go in to be a healer. Who knew that you were going to be assaulted to the point of taking your own life? This is just insane. And it is being allowed to continue because, honestly, some of the organizations don't want to talk about this. 
Uh, and by the way, we should be tracking this data because the CDC tracks everything else from how many people smoke cigarettes in this country to who's not wearing their seat belts. And, you know, we track physicians for how much time, you know, a friend of mine has to wear a monitor on her leg to, to you know, to how much time she spends in a patient room. And if she's in there too long, she gets dinged in trouble. But the minute you take your own life, it's like you never friggin' ever existed and breathed any air on this planet. You know, you're completely shunned. And, um, you know, it's not like, like I said, it's not like we're migrant farm workers. We all have social security numbers. Doctors are tracked every minute of the day. If you stray from the norm, you're potentially going to get in trouble. But the minute you kill yourself because you can't take the abuse, it's like you never existed. Same thing with medical students. They're paying $50,000 a year tuition for this abuse. Ugh. And their parents yeah. don't even know that their children, who are a few hours away, are at high risk of suicide until the police call them and tell them that their straight-A student who was a valedictorian is dead. You know what I mean? It's like, how can we allow this to continue? There's so, there's so much pain. I mean, you, you've done such an amazing job of sharing what it's like for our physicians. None of us, I can, I can guarantee you that none of the folks who haven't been through medical school here have a clue. This is a very closely held um, experience. Um, and I want, I, want to, I want to make sure we get Mike up. And one of the things that, that I think that's really important is that we, you, we start talking about how you started to get involved in helping doctors. Um, like, for instance, one of the things you said when I saw you speak at the physician's um, gathering to, to prevent physician suicide was how you boosted, you paid to boost your own Facebook page to reach more physicians. So tell us how you started getting contacted from physicians, how that started working out, and then we'll let Mike get in. Okay, well, I mean, chapter 39 in the book is one of my favorite chapters, and basically this book is 80% written by the victims, and so it's 53 chapters. Uh, six of the chapters are people who have actually died by suicide, and three I published their suicide notes, but the other 47 are actively suicidal physicians and medical students who've written me letters, and why would they write me a letter? I think it's because I have such a a large cyber footprint on this topic and nobody else does so when people are googling in the middle of the night for suicide help as physicians or medical students they're like automatically on my page you know what I mean um, and it's not because I did any special SEO stuff at the beginning I just wrote about it and I literally like can you believe this is the only one that's on this topic I went to these marketing conferences the other year and it's so funny that um, Somebody had at they were talking about your competition, and I raised and they said something like, "Who in here has no competitors?" <laughs> and I was like, "I don't." Uh, they're like, "Well, what what are you doing selling? You know, what are you selling?" It's like, well, I'm trying to help medical students and physicians uh, to stop, you know, preventing, you know, stop dying by suicide. And literally, I have no competition. It's an open market for me. Uh, and, and it's so funny because then doctors will be like, oh, wow, you know, you, you could really, this is a great side business for you. And it's like, give me a friggin' break. When is the right time to ask somebody for their credit card when they're writing you because they're suicidal? I'm not making money on this. I'm trying to save these people, and apparently nobody else is. So, uh, so I get these letters. I want to just read this one, and then I'll tell you what I'm doing now on social media to really try to boost this. But... Um, this is while I was secluded for a week writing the book in a hotel room. I secluded myself so I could just read through three and a half years of suicide letters that I've received and compile the best ones uh, in a book. <laughs> so I had to kind of do it at a fast pace because if I stopped to really think about what these people are writing for any moment, I could be taken down and triggered and spend the rest of the night crying. So this is kind of the best of the best suicide letters I've ever received. Um, so in the middle of that, I open my uh, computer, or I get a Facebook private message from this guy who lets me use his real name, and this was December 3rd. Dear Dr. Weibel, I'm not sure you read your Facebook messages, but feel compelled to thank you. I was finishing term two of med school and had a bottle of Xanax in my hand. I was ready, as so many of us are. I took three and then three more, and then came across this link, how to graduate medical school without killing yourself, which I believe may have saved my life and a couple of close friends who are also suffering. I'm near the top of my class and praying for death, to escape the trap I'm locked into. I was in true delirium from lack of sleep and fear of failure, studying in my sleep and 
waking up every hour in panic. Med school is doable, but why must it be taught in this format? I read your stories, and I'm just in shock how many others feel like I do or I feel like they do. Please keep sharing. You are saving lives, friend. So wow. that's a guy who's in the middle of a suicide attempt, and he just happened to get my How to Graduate Medical School Without Killing Yourself, which is a, a talk that I gave the very night that Rhonda Elkins died. <laughs> Uh, during my talk, um, and, so, and I... And, and so, Pamela, I think that the, when I read the book, it was so powerful. And for those of us that are watching and following us on Twitter, these stories can be really triggering for folks, right? And, I, and you even talked about it, how when you read this, you had to, when you read through these letters, you had to put yourself in a certain place, not to feel them too much, because they're very intense. So we wanted to let folks know we are talking about a really serious and real letters about people fighting suicide, and that... So some thoughts and feelings could get triggered and that folks know you can reach out to the SPSM community, you can call 1-800-273-TALK. It's really important as we're talking about this really serious and heavy subject that folks know how to get help. And that letter was a letter of hope, but this was somebody who was literally thinking about suicide in the moment, saw your um, a Facebook post and, and, and decided to reach out to you and that's incredible. Yeah, um, well, I put, by the way, just so you know, I've spent over $3,000 promoting that one blog on Facebook just to target it to medical students, just to try to prevent them from dying by suicide in medical school. That, like, why am I the, I mean, I, I'm happy to do this as long as my bank account will continue, I'll keep throwing money at this, but it seems like like there should be a larger organization that takes an interest in this. Like I also, I have a, a little uh, diary I keep full of now 263 cases of suicide among physicians. I just keep adding to it and certainly I shouldn't be the only one tracking this out of my home in my little office with my little pictures here, but it often feels like I'm the only one tracking these because I'm the go-to person. When people want to talk about losing a colleague, they call me up and tell me I lost my partner today to suicide and so I <laughs> uh, this is the I'm happy to do this by the way I just think there's a more efficient way to stop these suicides than me and my in my house doing this as a hobby between patients oh now, we, when we, you yeah, were. I in, I'm just gonna break in really briefly yeah. uh, because we want to talk about that and, and we're so glad to, to meet you Dr. Rival we want you to know that the truth <laughs> is about suicide that people just really aren't tracking it they aren't counting it uh, like not even in every state, uh, getting the data for that's really hard for anyone in the general public. Even though it's a 10 leading cause of death for the general public and the risk is higher for doctors, we are so sorry about this. And we're going to do our best to connect you with some resources because what you're doing is very valiant and no one should have to do this by themselves. It's too, it's, this is a, doctors deserve the same humane care and response that any of our patients deserve. And I'm going to turn this over to Mike now. And I totally appreciate you guys. Um, don't take my forceful kind of uh, pressured speech as like frustration. I just I'm passionate about this topic. That's all. We just want no. to know that we know this is a problem. I'm going to give it to Mike. No, I mean I I, I mean it, it, people can hear, people can see what your passion is about this, and people really appreciate it. Um, I kind of maybe shift a little bit to solutions. I mean when you uh, I I saw this talk when you were talking to medical students. Um, how when you talk to medical students, how it's received, and one of the the key things that that I thought was really cool is is you talked to about a concept of a balanced group um, in medical school or even a residency. Can you tell a little bit uh, a little bit about that? Who who not are not aware of what that is? So a balanced group is kind of um, I guess almost like a, it's a group meeting around feelings that come up uh, when treating patients. So for example, it, it gives us the opportunity to uh, improve our ability to treat patients by reflecting as a group on how patients made us feel. So for example, if you see a woman who reminds you of your mother, um, you might be interacting with that patient a little differently <laughs> than um, say a male patient who doesn't remind you of a family member. And so up until now, without a balance group, you would just be going home with those feelings, those unprocessed feelings from that visit. But having a balance group, which is a group of medical students or physicians that get together with a facilitator, it helps you understand how to be present for like these very difficult cases that might trigger things in you uh, because they even, you know, they remind you of a family member or, you know, let's just face it, sometimes we're taking care of people who've committed crimes. You know, one of these um, 
gentleman back here uh, who hung himself during his residency. I mean, part of the trigger, I think, for that is that he was uh, taking care of a rape victim and the rapist at the same time in neighboring rooms in the hospital. You know, they both needed surgical intervention, and I think that's a really strange situation to put a 25-year-old person in who just wants to help people with no emotional support. You know, these are things that, like, we need to process what to do do when you deliver a stillborn baby and you still hear the mother screaming like a week later. You know, these are things that we're, we're in the middle of traumatic situations and balant groups allow us to have like processing around patient feelings, you know, but uh, without it being like a psychiatric visit on yourself. What do they do? I Maybe I did not go to medical school because I knew I was unfit to do some of the things that I know that you have been trained to do. Just uh, not. But I'm very aware and work with very traumatic moments that are tense. Um, and I there is there are things that are in place for my training and and that the, that they encourage professionals in my discipline to do to stay well because it's really really hard, especially if you work in suicide prevention and some of your patients do die by suicide. My, can you and Mike talk, like, I can't imagine, what do they do for that 25-year-old doctor? What kind of care do they receive? None. Mike? Nothing. Yeah, 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 nothing. Nothing. They, they just say, go see the next patient. She's having a heart attack in room 404 or whatever. Well, what about your limbic system? I mean, you're not, you're not, your brain's not even fully baked at 25. It's a problem. This I mean, is that, that, that is one of the, the, the many problems with our current medical education system, and, and that's why Pamela's going in, going in there and trying to, you know, educate students, trying to educate, you know, educators and, and pointing out this problem. We need to talk about it more. But, yeah, as far as right now, what would happen right today, you know, not, not much to, to nothing, unfortunately. And, and I think even more importantly, what would happen, what would happen if the doctor asked for help? This minute. They yeah. know that they're dealing with an increased risk of suicide. They've known this for a long time. They're physicians. They're aware of public health. They can read CDC reports. I'm just having this minute. They know that, and they're and they're doing something that can make you sick. And I mean, they have protocols for if you get an accidental needle stick, and the chances of that impairing your health versus the other thing is actually really a lot different. I'm just having that minute with numbers in my head, Mike. Tell me. Well, that 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 is what is happening, you know, <laughs> and and you know, we, all of us who have been through that have had moments like that, have had many moments like that, very alone, very solitary, very by yourself, and then you just kind of keep going. And the people, unfortunately, who you know couldn't keep going are the pictures behind Pamela, which is very sad. So, but when I talk to soldiers who are in combat watching this happen. We have a whole healthcare system for the damage that it does and how to have a life after when they come back from that. You're telling me doctors can live like that and not escape until retirement and we've literally got no plan for that? Not only do we have no plan, if they ask for help, they can actually be punished and lose their license for having asked for mental health care. Yeah. So it's it's a, it's a big big problem, and I I actually received a phone call from a woman who uh, a resident who actually was getting written up for unprofessional behavior because she cried after seeing a patient, and she was calling me begging me to see if I had any literature that could prove to her superior that it's okay to cry, because she was being punished in her residency for crying. Yeah. Extremely 17th century. <laughs> so situation. I'm you, I've been a very like in in contrast of day of, a day at work uh, last summer. Uh, we'd had a couple of suicides that had been very bad and that had been witnessed by a lot of people. And I had taken reports and had sort of been doing the debrief, which was tough. Uh, I won't forget some of the stories that I you know bore witness to. And after that, m my vet tells calls me to basically say your cat's not. Your cat's very, you know, the results are that your cat is very, very sick and is, is going to die from this condition, either in two weeks or two years, or sort of, and the cat's still alive. But I was very upset, and I was crying at my desk. So 
someone overheard me, called my supervisor in the city an hour away to call him to check on me, to let me know that he cared about me, and to make sure that if I need to go home, I could go home, because sometimes it, it's, it's not okay if I'm that upset. And I was like, no, it's just my cat. I'll be fine, and I'll finish it. But I want you to understand, no one would expect me to deal with people who were suicidal without a great deal of support, because they'll look, cause I go bonkers. Yeah. Yeah, bonkers. That's what happened. We went bonkers here. So, like, really, I got bad news about my cat and yeah, cold. Yeah, my ball. Yeah. yeah. Well, well. On top of that, to make things worse, I mean, I have people that are writing me, telling me that they're in their OBGYN residency, working 110 hours a week, and they're having preterm contractions, and they're pregnant, and they're not allowed to go home, and they could lose their own baby, and they have to keep working through it, and. Um, it's just unbelievable what they are forcing medical students and physicians to do. It's inhumane. It's so inhumane. Uh, when I and, and this is why when I read the book, there was so much that just hit me. Um, she, some of the letters talked about how they, uh, doctors and, and residents couldn't even take time off for anything. That, that other doctors, if they knew the person was having an emotional crisis, well, I'm not going to fill in for you. I'm not going to cover your time that not only was it the management, but fellow physicians weren't supportive of each other um, in these crises. And, and so I get back to when we talk about Joyner and about things that predict suicide, we talk about burdensomeness, we talk about uh, a sense of belonging, and we talk about um, uh, acquired capacity. When you look at physicians all and, and the culture and the community of physicians in their workplace, which is the bulk of their lives, all three of these things are at high levels, right? And it just it hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, and I got I, I got quite emotional on the plane. I was in tears thinking about all these doctors going through all this. And here we and and when you think about it, people view doctors as being wealthy and getting to do whatever they want. And they're at the top of the food chain. And it turns out these folks are in incredible uh, stressful environments. They're in a tremendous amount of pain, and they're not even given permission to not be at work, to be offered to, to take care of themselves. And I, I think I would love for for Pamela to talk a little bit about physicians um, assistance programs because my experience with them has not been great um, and I think sometimes they're actually lethal to folks so um, I don't know if you comment on that at all or yeah there there's a program called the physicians health programs which apparently <laughs> exists to help us if we need health along the way <laughs> um, but they really are more geared towards substance abuse and they're just kinda like these um, you know, one-size-fits-all, AA-style, highly punitive programs that are policing and uh, treating agencies, and they make a lot of money uh, directly from the physicians that they ensnarl in this, in this program, which is the exact reason why um, this gentleman here died, uh, Greg died, uh, he, his suicide notes on the cover of my book, because Here's a very intelligent guy who I believe is probably agnostic, uh, atheist. He's not a big religious uh, dude, and um, you know he had, you know, he liked to drink every once in a while. He never was impaired at work. The guy is so excellent. Even two and a half years after his death, patients are still writing thank you notes on his legacy obituary page for having saved their lives and their family members' lives. But of course, who could save Greg's life? Uh, nobody because he was forced into a physician's health program for five years to have all this monitoring that was very de debilitating. I mean, his mother's a psychiatrist at one point. You know, he was mandated to go 300 miles out of state to a program instead of getting local treatment, uh, which is what you should do is keep somebody at home in a place where they feel safe with their family members. And anyway, I mean, he called his mother at one point, who's a psychiatrist, and when he got off the phone, they, they made fun of him. They're like, oh, you had to call your mommy. I mean, they treated him like crap. And so, you know, these people are really smart. Their uh, AA is not going to work for everyone. And uh, definitely people who get sent there for, there's a gynecologist that had to go through this program because he got balloons from his patient and they got him in trouble for boundary issues. The guy didn't do anything. He just received balloons from a happy woman after she delivered a baby. You know what I mean? These, these people are thrown into these programs and they can't get out for at least five years. 
and it's just unbelievable. Uh, for getting balloons from a patient, you have to do urine urine dips and at your own expense. And even if you don't have a substance abuse problem, they put you on. If you have bipolar, you're going to be put on an AA style substance abuse program. And these people are totally immune. You can't even go after them legally. They're like somehow with the government and these programs. I don't understand the ins and outs, but they, they should be in trouble for malpractice for having killed this guy. You know, but like you can't go after them because they're somehow protected. To, I don't understand them completely, but you know, the bottom line is you've got a vulnerable population of people who just wanted to help people as healers on this planet, and they're being tormented to death from day one of medical school onward. From getting okay, I this oh. is my mind because I what so when I have colleagues who are having their own healthcare needs and they need a referral. Uh, because I do a lot of outreach and a lot of networking, I always very discreetly help my colleagues get a good referral, just the same as I would help any human being get a good referral to some place to take care of their health so that they can be good practitioners and good colleagues. Right. I, I do that all yes. the time it, because I assume that mental health care is just as normal as any kind of health care, and I'm happy to help people get what they need. And I'm so glad that they're asking. I assume that they're the folks that are the better doctors because they're the ones who ask right. and get their exactly. help. So, Mike, can you like, what what are you supposed to do in this? I, this is horrifying. What are you supposed to do in this situation? What's everyone doing, Mike? Um, I mean, you know, I, I wish we had like you know a million Pamela's out there trying to just raise awareness of this, you know. And and I, I know we're getting get, getting short on time, um, but in addition to your book. You know, I, I, I've seen you promoting, and uh, and I saw a trailer for a film called Do No Harm. Can you tell people about that and why it's important and how people can support it? Yeah, so there's a film. We're probably going to change the title, but the uh, tentative title is Do No Harm. Uh, through my blog, by the way, idealmedicalcare.org slash blog, I have all the links to the film and all the stuff. So, And by the way, I respond to any email. If anyone wants to email me and ask me any question, I'm very responsive and all of that. But it would really help. We need to raise like $360,000 to do this film. Um, and so anyone that wants to sponsor this film and have their name on the big screen, you know, we're going to enter it into Sundance next year. We've already finished shooting like half of it. It's extremely compelling. The um, nearly three minute trailer is available online. Um, so you should watch that and maybe I could give you a link and you could, I think that's on the little site, the SPSM site. I, th I think you guys put yeah. the link to the film it there. Is. People want to see it. So, um, but but to, I, I want to like finish this one thing about the physician health program. Um, if I can, this woman um, Amy wrote me a letter. She said, I'm amazed at the punitive terms I've had to face in recovering professionally from a depressive episode for which I was hospitalized last year. One of my requirements is to be urine tested for substance abuse despite multiple demeaning assessments that have rendered the clear verdict that I don't have a substance abuse problem. I've had to attend costly treatments for professionals in which I am the only female in a group of male physicians who have had sex with their patients or have become assaulted with staff. Any efforts on my part to point out that I don't quite fit or taken as further evidence of my pathology. I'm a single parent as well, so that each of these treatments I'm required to attend takes me away from my two children for extended periods of time. Throughout all of this, nobody has told me how common my feelings are, that a large number of doctors feel depressed and suicidal at times. Rather, I've been told that my actions are unheard of for someone in mental health and may preclude me from ever providing therapy again since we tell patients to never give up hope, but you did. Hopefully, in the near future this won't be a taboo subject and there will be places for those like me to seek responsible and confidential care. So this is a problem. We need healthy doctors and our doctors are being tormented every step of the way. So, uh, so we're in the last we're in the last stretch. It's really really clear I have to tell you I feel embarrassed that I did not realize I, I do the poverty of resources for doctors that I didn't realize what the trauma rates were for doctors developing PTSD, for doctors experiencing suicidal ideation when they come in with above average mental health and they leave at high risk for suicide, and, and that we make it very hard for them to then get supportive care to heal or to recover. Um, I feel like um, in suicide prevention we've done a lot about saying we want doctors to provide suicide risk screenings to patients. 
We've said we want primary care doctors to provide safety planning. So we've done a lot of saying we want primary care doctors to be suicide competent, but we have not, prop I, I'm really certain, have not adequately sort of weighted the fact that they are an at-risk population. Bart, am I, am I, and I'm, I'm hoping that some of the other suicidologists on the Twitter feed can chime in. Am I missing something? Did we forget them somehow? I think that this this didn't it didn't hit anybody's radar. We didn't stop to think. We don't. I, I think one of the things we don't think of doctors as being people. I think really that's one of the things when I stopped and checked myself as I read the book. It was like, oh my god, we we've got doctors elevated at this level that that when we even think about them as people, that's such a big leap for us to make. It doesn't even occur to us that we need. Or did any of us know what medical school is like, or what the what the trauma is like in medical school? I had no idea. How would we know this? I don't think doctors. And uh, you know, Pamela and Kirk, I don't think they're encouraged to share how horribly they're abused in medical school. And I guess the only folks that talk about it are the folks that didn't make it out of medical school. So of course they're the losers, right? They they're the ones that were, of course, they're upset they didn't make it through medical school. Um, and so I think that's why this work is so important. We're talking about a high pressure, high intensity, high stress job where people aren't trained to be human. The humanness is almost bred out of them. The way it's described. Um, and, and here's what happens. This is why I've been on this kick about we need to stop asking about the individual risk factors inside people and the cultural risk factors. This is a clear example of how the environment folks are in produces the, the suicide risk, right? These folks weren't at risk of suicide until they went to medical school, right? And yeah. the experiences they had, and we don't make it okay for them to get help. We don't make it safe. I think I, I, it's interesting because about two months into my recovery, I got sent to this, this psychologist who was going to send me to a, a, a version of these physicians' um, uh, health programs. And he did everything to scare me away and described how horrible it was, but, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was really mad at him. I was like, this is insane. I realized he was doing me a favor. He made it sound as bad as he possibly could because he knew that it would be horrible for my health. So think about that for a minute. Even many of the people connected to these programs know that they aren't helping people. They're hurting people. They're policing people. They're not there to, to help them get better. And if we didn't have folks like, like Dr. Weibel speaking up about this, none of us would even know about it. Uh, and I'd like to know more about how the medical community reacts to this. We could have a whole other show on that, would be my guess. And even within these physician health programs, there's an increased suicide risk. I mean, they were even back into 1978 or so, there was an article in JAMA about all the doctors we lost in Oregon who are in these physician health programs. So. Um, and, and one other thing I want to mention, you know, kind of before the end of this is, you know, you bring these people in that are high-functioning valedictorians, you know, they leave, by the time they graduate medical school or their residency or whatever, they have like over 50, 60 percent of them are what they call burned out, and I can't stand that term because it's a victim blaming and shaming term and it makes the individual feel like they just couldn't keep up somehow and this is all over the press and this is what doctors are calling themselves now I'm just burned out it's not your fault stop using victim blaming and shaming terms this is an occupational hazard of the profession you have been abused the diagnosis is abuse the thing is that we're never gonna solve a problem if we misdiagnose it right and so I'm just a real stickler for using the right terminology. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah. I wish we were sticklers about words, but the truth is we're just, um, the, when, when it comes to talking about suicide, or if you're the only one talking about it, then we're just going to talk about it, and we'll figure it out as we go. Um, everybody is, uh, this is one of those ones where I'm watching the Twitter feed, and everyone's doing a lot of this, like, why mm -hmm. didn't you realize this was so bad? Um, we are getting to the last few minutes for final thoughts, and, and I'd like uh, it would be okay for Bart to start, and then we'll hit Mike, and then we'll hit you. Uh, Bart, do you have some final thoughts after this hour? Uh, my final thoughts are that, um, one, uh, that this is an important issue. We need to be talking about it. If It's amazing to me how much uh, media coverage things like Ebola get, right, and things like that. But here, physicians um, die, are dying of suicide. Um, the suicide uh, uh, problem we have in this country in general gets almost no traction, right? We, it doesn't get a lot of attention. Um, and even, even when something like this, physicians, you think that would get, garner a lot of attention, it's still hard to get people to pay attention. So I really appreciate Dr. Weibel speaking up and telling her story um, because this is how things change. So thank you. Dr. Seville. 
Uh, well, it's something we didn't we didn't get to tonight. I I do want to give a big big shout out to her because you know she you know you got out you know and we didn't even get to the part of the story where you got out of a, a assembly line medicine and you reached out to your patients and you said what do you want you know a clinic to be what do you want your visits to be I mean I, I want people to go to idealmedicalcare.org to kind of see that part of your story which is you know uh, <laughs> she's funny she's hilarious and what I, I want to point out your other book here too that I was uh, reading the, the uh, uh, pet goats and pap smears and which is a whole other show about how that came about but there, there is a, there is a great part to this story, um, and, and I really uh, appreciate Pamela being here, and then you've been proactive to kind of change your practice and what you're doing, and you're happier now. Um, but but to bring up this very topic, uh, I think is very important. And, and thanks for being here tonight. Yeah, thank you. And I think you know, just so you know, this physician suicide letters book is mostly focused on solutions at the end. And the, the, the big solution for all of this is honestly to let our doctors be real doctors again. That's what they always wanted to do. And if they could be left alone to have their ideal clinics, which is very easy to do, once they're living their soul's purpose, they're further and further away from suicide. Okay, it's the frustration of being trapped in a big box clinic where you can't get out and you're a victim that leads you to all sorts of hopelessness, helplessness, let me jump off the roof sort of thoughts. And, and one a final thought that I think is kind of cool is there are other countries that do not censor media, uh, censor uh, media covering suicide as much, like India, when there's suicides there of medical students, they report it on the evening news, they read the suicide note on the evening news, often the students are labeling exactly why they died and they're actually going out and arresting people that are in the suicide notes. So they take action, they don't hide this here in the U.S. I, if you die by suicide, if you're lucky, it'll say man found dead in building. You never know it's a medical student, you never read the suicide note, everything's buried forever. So I kind of like the Indian method. <laughs> uh, this, you've had another hour with us and there is no doubt off reading the Twitter feed how powerfully impacted people were. I want you to again, I know that several of you, because uh, because of your own mental health, have chosen to turn off the Twitter feed or the audio stream and or or watch or you know staying tuned via the Twitter feed because that's a better choice. Good job choosing what's best for you. Uh, if you do need to talk with somebody, you can go to crisischat.org tonight or 1-800-273-8255, 1-800-273-TALK. Um, if, if you do need to chat, um, I will say that um, one of sort of for final thoughts. I mean, we did have uh, Dr. Craig Bryan and Mike Nestis, and there was a wonderful study talking about we about dangerous words, whether or not um, talking about suicide is triggering in a way that changes people's risk for suicide. And the truth is, we haven't studied that much. What we do know is that not talking about it has not saved any lives. So we're going to do our best. This is the SPSM mission, which is to bring together experts in the different parts of this. And I think. Uh, my big final thought is that I think I'm going to be more compassionate towards my doctors. I know that I expect so much from providers. I'm going to practice compassion because it looks as if practicing compassion on people may reduce suicide risk, not just for doctors, but for all people. And I think that's our closing thoughts for tonight. Take care of yourself. This is important. Uh, so we're going to share our messages this week. Good job, everybody. Take care. Good night. Thank you.